Hello, everyone, and welcome to this webinar. I'm Francis Seeley from Global Net 21 and Empel Voices, a local group. And this is one of the regular webinars we do once or twice a week, which, which is great because we interview a lot of people who are doing interesting things locally, nationally, and uh, um, globally as well. And today we're going to talk to Claire Maloney, who's with us, because Cloney, Claire has started a, a project or is involved in a project called Hinterlands, which is looking at the waterways in London and how we can sort of involve arts on that and involve young people as well. Uh, it's a really interesting project she, that she will tell us about. So, Claire, you know, thank you for joining us today. And maybe we could start by you very briefly telling us a little about yourself and how you got interested in Hinterlands. Sure. So um, I'm an independent freelance creative producer, and I suppose I'm interested in um, producing and delivering projects that take place outside of traditional or conventional art spaces so it's all about getting people involved in the arts in, and experiencing creativity but outside of the say gallery theater cinema space or museum space and actually taking place in a lot of community contexts including obviously public spaces green spaces um yeah and so re trying to trying to i suppose engage audiences and participants who wouldn't for a whole host of reasons necessarily uh, visit a museum or a gallery. And, um, and, what, and why do you think that Waterways was a good location to do that on? I mean, the project Hinterlands is conceived by Canal and River Trust. The Canal and River Trust are a national charity who manage 2,000 miles of waterways in England and Wales. And they um, they wanted to commission five different creative producers around uh, the, the England and Wales region. Um, to develop a creative program engaging communities in what they saw as underused parts of the waterway. So the area that I'm particularly working in is in Enfield and Tottenham, and it's the River Lee Navigation Waterway, about six miles stretch running through Enfield and Tottenham. Um, and it's where I think Canaan River just chose this particular stretch of waterway because it's where it's quite densely populated. So there's quite a lot of people living within one to two kilometers of the canal but where they feel like they could engage those communities more in that green space, in that in that kind of waterway. And also where there might be low engagement with the arts or fewer um, local creative opportunities within that area. So the project was Canal and River Trust's idea, but then they recruited me to come up with a program to engage local communities creatively in a creative exploration with the canal. So it's a kind of, it's a creative journey that the communities have gone on with the artists that have got involved in the project together to creatively explore the canal. Not only it's kind of like attributes and its beauty, but also its problems. You know, the canal is, is also quite a challenging space. It's quite, contested you know um between pedestrians cyclists and then it's quite busy with uh, boats moored there and um, there can be litter there can be antisocial behavior so it was really like looking at that space in a very honest way you know looking at its attributes and its beauty but also like there are issues lots of people feel don't always feel safe around those spaces so um it was kind of like being very open about what the challenges of that space could be, but also thinking creatively about solutions. How could we perhaps develop an arts program that will start to change behavior in that space or encourage people to spend more time there or encourage people to think of it as a space that where they can socialize and connect with other people, but also experience art. Yeah, I mean, you know, during my lifetime, there have been so many initiatives to get art to people who don't normally engage in it. And it's not always been successful. I mean, is it a real problem to get people to participate? And what sort of things do you have to do to get them to do that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I think there are all sorts of reasons why someone might not visit a gallery or a museum. Sometimes those spaces... I mean, they're wonderful spaces and full of resource and learning and education and creativity. But sometimes those spaces can be intimidating. Sometimes, you know, people don't necessarily have the time. <laughs> you know, they're, they're, you know, they might be working lots of different jobs. They've got caring responsibilities. 
Um, I think when going into a, a public space, a green space or a, a water side or waterway, I think you have to build up a relationship with the community. I mean, it's just not good enough to say, oh, we're going to do some lovely art and creative things, just come and get involved. I think you have to find out about that community. I think you have to uh, learn um, what they like, <laughs> you know, what they're interested in um, and come up and come up with something with them. You know, I always try and think of the community as kind of co-producers in a project. So it's not just, you know, you know, arriving with a ready-made project. It's also it's kind of a journey that we that we discover together. So the nice thing about Hinterlands is we piloted it in 2018 and we did a lot of creative consultation with different communities around Enfield. So we just basically asked them, we asked them to give their honest feedback about the canal. We asked them what sort of um, not just art, but recreational activities they were interested in. And that's how we built the programme. And that's how we sort of continued to deliver the programme. So, for example, um, one part of the programme involved three different artists working with three different primary schools at different junctures of the canal and coming up like like coming up with creative solutions. Um, so one school Prince of Wales School in Enfield has been very concerned about the littering and the kind of antisocial behaviour and the way people treat the environment. Um, and so they work with an artist to create some visual artworks and poetic signage that is now installed on the canal as sort of semi-permanent artworks to encourage people to spend time there, to value the space and to to care for it and to see it as a, as a community asset, not somewhere, you know, to mistreat yeah. or, or, or dump your rubbish, but to actually just take the time and value what's there. And that, to be honest, that really was children led. We didn't lead them in that, that they, when they first visited the site, um, you know, they could see what was left in the water. They could see what was left by the water side. And they were really concerned about it. And they felt that that was a real strong motivation for them. Well, let me, let me ask you a bit about that in a minute, because I want to, you know, talk about your, your work with schools. Um, but, but, you know, you say you have a bottom up approach and you work with artists. You mentioned you work with three, Joshua, Paula and Julia, I guess those are the three. Um, I, I mean, you find out what the community wants. Then do you have to find the artists that will relate to that community or do you have them already? Um, yeah, so with the case with Joshua Bilton, he'd, he'd worked on the, um, the pilot with me. So I, I, I knew a lot about his practice. He's very much a, he's quite a conceptual artist, but he's also very, uh, he has a very socially engaged practice. So he delivers a lot of education workshops in, edu in different like school and community contexts. Um, ditto with Julia, she's done a lot of arts therapy and educational work and Paula actually is um, a sculptor and she hadn't worked a lot in those environments but she, um, her, and, her and Julia teamed up so they sort of supported each other through the process. So I think it's a bit of both, I think it is finding the artist with the right practice and the right um, attitude mm -hmm. and approach. But also, I think it's supporting an artist who may not have had much experience in that, but saying, I'm really interested in working in this context, you know. So we were able to do both of those things on this project, which is which is really great. I mean, you, you, you've you chosen to work in certain areas. I mean, how did you choose those areas? For example, Enfield in Tottenham is one of those areas. What led you to that? Um, again, it was it was um, Canal and River Trust sort of identifying different parts of the canal that they wanted to um, undergo a positive transformation. And then I was I was given a certain amount of autonomy. So and they're, they're all quite different. So the site that I mentioned with Prince of Wales, they've actually adopted their bit of canal. So it's a bit of canal near Rami Marsh and, and Waterside near Rami Marsh. And the schools adopted it, which means they're going to kind of care for it. And, you know, that can range from anything doing regular litter picks or they could grow stuff there. I mean, my my hope is that now that we've installed some artworks there, that they treat it as a kind of uh, as, a, as a gallery space or, you know, if they wanted to do a performance there. Um, so it's like their space to kind of curate, you know, in, in the longer term. But that's quite a rural area. It's right near Rami Marsh. It doesn't even feel like London. You know, it's so quiet and it feels 
very, very um, non-urban. And then one of the other junctures of canal is through the Meridian Water Development up in Edmonton. And that's a very industrial part of the canal. So again, a very different kind of looks very different architecturally, atmospherically. And then up in Tottenham, it's much more, it's right by Ferry Lane Estate. So very residential. Um, so they have all, they have different kinds of flavours, which is great and different things to work with, you know, diff you get a different response with each of those sites because there's like, in terms of what's there, in terms of nature, what's man-made, what's industrial, it's, all, it's very, very, it varies. So you get a very different kind of response. I mean, you make a, a lot out of partnering with schools, which is a big part of what you do. I mean, how do you get the schools involved? How do you approach them? um the way i do it i think is to always so i was trying to find schools very near the the canal obviously um but i i, I approach the head because then ultimately it will be the head's decision and i've been really lucky in that all three schools that i've um got on board with this project have been very very enthusiastic and they really value the arts and they really value um the opportunities for children to engage with nature. So Prince of Wales School, for example, is a forest school. So that means they, they have a lot of green space around their school anyway. They have amazing amount of trees planted within the school grounds. And they try and ensure that every child has at least one lesson outside per week. So one, le one lesson per week outside. Um, which is why I thought they would be a great candidate to adopt their own canal site. Um, so they're, you know, they're, they're already very, you know, environmentally aware and conscious. Um, Raynham School in Edmonton, which is, it, it's a short distance from the canal, but again, they, you know, if you go for a tour around their school, they've got a little farm, they're growing things. So I, there's already this, you know this value of of green space and of nature and what and the benefits it can bring to children so i think yeah all three schools have been really open to that and really open to the arts as well because obviously you know curriculum wise the arts does get you know played down by our by our governments by people who you know make these decisions from the top up and it kind of gets, you know, it's getting increasingly squeezed out of the curriculum and, and they, you know, all the teachers that I've worked with really understand, you know, the trans, it's not just about being creative, but the other kinds of advantages in terms of well-being, confidence, collaboration, but also because we're working outside thinking about, you know, geography, biochemistry, um, history, you know, it crosses so many different subjects. But is, it, but is it sort of linked into the curriculum as well? I mean, it crosses subjects and very often when that happens, it sort of gets left out or it's put to the sideline. Do you work with the teachers to integrate it into the curriculum? It's different each time. So with one of the schools we did with Raynham, they felt that um, because they're a free form entry school, so there's 90 children in each year um, to justify being part of the project um, and using up their time. Um, they gave us, well, they, what they did was they gave us their arts curriculum and the things that they wanted to hit within a certain amount of time. So we, you know, very creatively with the artist devised the program around that. So if they had to do certain things around um, figurative drawing or, you know, collage or, you know, we, we could we could respond to that, but still staying true to the project, which was, you know, really allowing the children to creatively explore and that's that's been an, that's been a really successful project the children have actually with the artist co-designed a sculpture um which i must i don't know if you've seen which is now installed just outside building blocks in sight of the canal yeah in you call you call that which is quite interesting an active sculpturing project what does that mean because that's quite an interesting concept Oh, so that the active sculpture was the one in Tottenham. This this ah. sculpture was actually designed with the children, and and not only that. So it's one of the children's. The overall um, sculpture now that you see is one of the children's designs, and then within that, it's going to incorporate all the other children's designs. But what was lovely about that process was they they really got to grips with what a sculpture is. So they thought about, you know, they had an idea and then they sketched that idea and then they made a prototype and they thought about scale, they thought about material, they thought about location. 
um, and site and they thought about how it's installed and they thought about how you encourage people to come and engage with that artwork so they thought they they went through every bit of the process of creating an artwork and then what happens afterwards and actually at one point they visited building blocks and drilled bits of the sculpture together with their parents which was amazing so they got to actually construct part of the sculpture as well so it's this very like 360 degree process of understanding how you make an artwork how it starts with something that's quite you know not visible and conceptual and in your head and then becomes this real thing that other people are going to engage with i mean you also i noticed you have this interesting thing called the history detective project which i would think would quite excite to young people i mean what is that because that's quite interesting yeah so this is what we're working on now um we're mm -hmm. working with a group of young people from an act youth club so they're 12 to 14 year olds and we are going to be next year working with orchard side school on the same project as well um so the idea is there's a lot of um interesting industrial heritage around the canal in enfield and tottenham and it's not really commonly known there's you know there was a royal small arms factory um which is now enfield island village that was there from the crimean war up until the 80s um, there's one of the oldest flour mills, I think, in the country, Wright's Flour Mill up in Ponders End. Uh, up in Tottenham, there's the Beam Museum, Beam Engine Museum. There's so much. And there's still quite a lot of people who live in the area or close to the area that worked in those industries as well. Um, and I wanted to, as part, of the, as part of Hinterlands, I wanted to deliver a project that brought the older and younger generations together. Because when we in the in the first part of the, um, the project when we were doing our consultations, something that kept coming up was, you know, um, there's a lot of there's a lot of gang activity in certain parts of Enfield, and people feel nervous around younger people. And I just felt like this might be a positive project to actually bring different generations together. And I like the idea of younger people uncovering the history. Um, so and the way to really draw them in was to make a heritage app or a digital artwork that tells the story of this really interesting heritage um, around the waterways so the kids are going to be doing research they're going to be um, taking archival images recording making field recordings taking their own images and working with digital media artists sdna who are this amazing um, digital media studio do a lot of work around heritage um, to create um, a heritage app that the public can then use and it will be kind of geolocation responsive. So the idea is someone will use their device and be walking uh, down a particular part of the canal or a, or a heritage site nearby and that will trigger, you know, an augmented reality image. So, for example, you could be standing in Enfield Island Village, hold up your device and see what was there, maybe a, a scene from the factory during the First World War or something like that, for an example. But we're just at the beginning of that now. So at the moment, we've just trained the kids in oral history um, skills because they're going to be interviewing some older members of their community in a few weeks time. And then they're going to be working with SDNA over a couple of sessions to start thinking about the images that they want to use in the app and how to animate them. So they're going to be doing like stop frame animation and yeah just thinking of the different ways that they can manipulate the images in an interesting way like coloring them in and to help tell the story in a kind of vibrant way um about Enfield's and uh Tottenham's history I mean I was going to ask you about your intergenerational work because we've been concentrating on schools but you don't just deal with schools do you you deal with other people as well I mean when you do intergenerational work and you describe what it is how do you find the older people um, and how do you get young people to engage with them? Well, in this context, I mean, we're talking to, so we've got a few partners who have, you know, very generously supported the project, Enfield Society, um, the RSA Trust. So we're working through their networks to find uh, older people. For example, there are a couple of former apprentices of the Royal Small Arms Factory that we're hoping to interview. Um, a few weeks ago, I took um, an act, a group of kids from an act up to the Beam Engine Museum in Tottenham and the chair of that museum, his father, you know, was um, 
involved in the sewage works around which the museum is constructed. So he's willing to be interviewed. So, and then we'll just do a much more local call out. So we'll just do, yeah, we'll just, just work through local networks, but do, do a call out. Um, I think Gunpowder Mills, for example, has a really interesting archive. Um, yeah, so, and, and the kids have sort of talked about who they might want to meet as well, like the sorts of questions they want to ask. So that, that kind of directs who we might invite. So what's going to happen in a few weeks in early December is we're going to have a reminiscence session and then some one-to-one -one recorded interviews oh, that's, led, that's, by, led by the young people. Yes. So. That's, that, that's really an interesting project to develop. I mean, you obviously have projects, but you do workshops as well, don't you? What, what, what's the difference between developing a project and having a workshop? Well, they kind of go hand in hand, to be honest, with this project. So the workshops, um, for example, with the schools that we've talked about, are led, are, are led by the artist. The artist will develop a program with me um, of workshops which might involve a visit to the canal and then some, you know, some canal based task to really like explore, <clears throat> really explore that site. Um, thinking so, for example, um, thinking about patterns, reflections, edges, the different kinds of structures on that site. Um, one of the artists, Josh, did a really wonderful thing um, with the school, Ferry Lane School, up in Tottenham, because there's a history there of there have been some fatalities in that canal, not for a long time, but a few years ago, and so there was a there was a sense of fear, I think, around the canal, and he got the children to find their match in nature. So we got them to trace the lines, the, the lines on their hand, and then go and visit the canal side and find find the match there, you know, in, in nature growing along the canal. And it was just a very beautiful and simple way to connect oneself with that environment. And I think that the kids really engage with that site now, and they've really loved working with Josh. So I think it's kind of dissipated that fear or that sense of trepidation or that that that's a dangerous space of course it's you know it's a space where you have to take care there's water there and there's speeding cyclists but they kind of understand that as long as you do take care you can also find you know plenty to enjoy um and yeah find a sense of creativity by being in that space well, so, obviously see yeah, i was gonna say obviously you're trying to get people to connect with nature which is great but nature is changing and climate change is doing that you know considerably and i mean does climate change in any way figure in the work you do uh in the projects you develop we don't start we don't start the project with saying this is going to be about climate change to be honest um i just think climate change it's if you if you're ignorant of climate change then uh, it's like I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how anyone can be because it's 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 omnipresent. I mean, it's everywhere and it's it's tangible. And I think young people are so tuned into it. So, you know, as I mentioned earlier, Prince of Wales School are incredibly concerned about the environment and wrote lots of poems about you know value you know value this space now because once it's gone, it's gone you know and we need to value our environment and we need to value our wildlife and we haven't dictated that to them that's something that they're already thinking about you know that, that that's in their consciousness um so i don't think we've ever started the project saying this is that we're exploring climate change i mean there's nothing wrong with that approach that's just not the approach we've used in this instance but it's there it's present i think it's underlying underpinning everything you know yeah, but but you are developing a project aren't you on climate grief so that sort of comes up front when you're doing that yeah so that that's a very different project so this this is nothing to do with the hinterlands program i'm working with um a collective of artists called dissonant futures they're a really interesting um group of people from different arts and creative disciplines like filmmakers, uh, VR, virtual reality artists, um, writers, uh, dramaturgs, live performers, documentary makers, and uh, a couple of the collective are trained death doulas. So that these are people who will um, work with um, people with a terminal illness and their families at end of life. So they offer end of life care. Um, 
and this collective of artists came together out of a shared obviously concern about the climate and wanted to do a project that really explored climate grief and by climate grief I guess the way it's a kind of anticipatory grief I suppose it's a sense of you know the losses to come if we don't look after our planet if we don't change <laughs> the way that we consume and exist um but also recognizing what's already been lost and i suppose there's a real parity with the pandemic right because even if you even if you haven't lost someone directly through the covid pandemic the loss the sense of loss is palpable you know that you know you know that lots of people have died lots of people have lost their health lots of people have lost their work their livelihood this that's the sense of that loss is really palpable and i suppose that's one way of equating what climate grief is this you know this worldwide universal sense of loss because everyone is is it is going to experience that if they haven't already i i like the term you use with this in the future is you call it ecological mourning is that something you have sort of invented a term or is that something that's widely used because it sort of sums up what lots of people are going through i i'm, I'm going to be honest that's not my term so i one of the collective it might be lina langbeck who's um uh, an amazing writer and one of the collective members and so I think that's her term so yeah I guess it's this sense of um, universal mourning you know and the sense that everybody can appreciate or will <laughs> at some point experience what what that means but actually being open you know being open about that grief um, I suppose when I was when I was growing up um, the sense of the nuclear threat was really palpable and I think for young people now it's climate change it's so palpable and it's so scary and it kind of underpins everything you know it's a real kind of existential concern and I think I think it's that it's that feeling. So when you I mean I know you're just developing this project but is your aim to sort of confront pain and loss that go through or are you trying to give people hope by spurring them into action as well? both <laughs> so it's, it's it's a challenge so um basically the program will be um a series of creative workshops that will start with a vr experience so it's a vr experience created by the shape of us um which sorry it's created by heartwire and it's called the shape of us and it's very much a kind of um half an hour 40 minute experience just talking about um, ex, you know, taking the taking the participant on a journey through climate change and what's been lost, um, but also, you know, hopefully engendering hope. So it's that that VR experience is intend, intended as a provocation to start a creative discussion and then a creative response to climate grief, um, and thinking about how we might develop a new language together. So the artists and the workshop participants together might create a new language for how we talk about this grief but also what what we might need to do to spur ourselves into action so not just to fall into like despair but to actually okay how do we galvanize if we acknowledge that we do feel grief but how do we galvanize these feelings so that they actually produce something hopeful and constructive and the nice thing about the workshops is with they're happening around the country and we're partnering with um the albany theater in london um, Govan Hill Baths up in Glasgow, Birmingham Open Media in Birmingham and Commonwealth Common Space up in Bradford. And these organisations are really allowing us to engage with a very diverse audience. So, for example, Govan Hill Baths work a lot with um, Roma and refugee groups. Um, the Albany, I think we're going to work with young people and actually the Albany is the lead partner in the Lewisham London Borough of Culture next year, which the theme of which is climate change. So it all fits really, really well. But I think we really wanted to engage people who are often kept out of the discourse around climate change. It can often be a very privileged group, a minority talking about climate change and, you know, the people that actually it is going to affect or affect most are often excluded from that conversation so it's really important for us to think about you know who to, to be as inclusive as possible and also 
to readily admit we don't have all the answers we're going this is also going to be a process of discovery we're going to come up with this language together and what will happen is that through creating this new language and exploring different sounds of grief um, this is going to feed into a sound memorial installation which will be a live installation that will travel around these different locations that I've mentioned, but also be an online work that will be constantly evolving as well, but informed very much about by what comes out of the workshops with the participants. So when will this project be launched and how could well, people get involved? Okay, so I'm hoping, so we're, we're developing the project now, we're applying for funding, so providing that that's all successful, uh, it would launch in spring next year, early spring next year. So um, the best thing to do is we are going to set up a Facebook page. So like, let's look at look out for that and a website. So look out for that. And that's how we'll be communicating uh, with people. And obviously through these different organizations that I've mentioned as well um, around the country, they can find out through those as well. And uh, I mean, you're a very active person, obviously, and a very enthusiastic person. Do you have any other projects on, on you know, online that you're going to get involved with? Um, I, I mean, nothing to do with the environment. So I, I mean, you know, it, I don't know if you've ever been a freelancer, but you end up saying yes to lots of stuff, which is great because it's never, it's never the same, you know, it's always different, different projects. So at the moment, I'm working um on a film that was made so i live in a housing cooperative on the thames and um one of the residents here made a film during the pandemic about what you know a kind of a micro a microcosm of what was going on for everyone during the pandemic but basically based around this context of the residents living in the housing co-op so at the moment i'm helping to promote promote that film through doing a series of community screenings um so we're planning one um in january february of next year hopefully it's going to be at hackney picture house um and we'll have some poets reading their work um around themes that resonate with the with the film if, so. if you if you let me know about that we'll uh, sort of say oh no that. i definitely will yeah, yeah. we will yeah. let people know on social networks because that'd be great i mean that sounds a really really good project yeah it's, it's a really beautiful film and it just showed um at, at folkestone over the weekend and it it premiered at the sheffield documentary film festival in may and was nominated for best first feature and it had its london premiere at open city docks in september so yeah, and I think people really respond to it because it's something that everybody can relate to. And I think it's quite nice that that sort of sense of solidarity, you know, that, you know, your those feelings of anxiety, because um, it was filmed from the beginning of the lockdown, right towards the second lockdown that happened in the latter part and the early part of this year, latter part of last year. Um, and I think it's just it's just very it, it resonates with a lot of people, you know, and I think it's quite a good record and document of this time. OK, so we sort of come to the end of the half hour now. It goes really, really quickly. So if anybody wanted to sort of find out more about what you're doing, get involved with any other projects like Hinterlands or the, the Climate Grief Fund, I mean, where would they go to? Where would they find out more? Um, well, I, I can give you my website. Um, so in terms of all the projects that I'm involved in, they're on there. So it's just clairemaloney.org. <laughs> um, quite easy to remember. Um, and you can find us on Facebook and on Twitter. Um, if you just Google Hinterlands London, you'll find us so that all the details of the projects are on there as well. Okay, well, I mean, it sounds like you're doing a, a lot of things and a lot of really, really important things. And I like the way you're working from bottom up and that you're involving people in the design, you know, the buzzword co-produce with them. Um, that, that's really important and that's quite exciting. And, you know, I hope people will find out more. And if, as I said, if you give us the information, we'll um, pass it on around social networks so they get to know about it. Um, because what you're doing is really, really important. So, you know, Claire, thank you for taking part in this. It's been a really interesting interview. Thank so, you. It's been really lovely to talk. And I can what I can do is share the links with you afterwards. So, you know, that they can be shared around as well. The links that I just mentioned. 
Okay. Well, let, let's do that. And, you know, thank you very much indeed. And we'll uh, end this um, interview now. <laughs>